Hi, everybody. Welcome to Design Conversations presented to you by Home Publishing's group and my design studio. My name is Emmanuel Bellabo, and that's Yasmin, Yasmin. Goodwin. <laughs> and today, Yasmin's coming to you live from the offices at my design studio and me. Well, I'm in my, my home office here again. So this is episode three in a six part series on the impact of COVID-19 on the design industry. And uh, we just want to take a quick second to say that this would not be possible without the support of HPG and our sponsors, uh, Lixel Group, Constantino, Fisher & Paykel, Kentwood, through Metropolitan Floors. So thank you very much for allowing us to bring this, these episodes to you. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. So how you been, Yasmin? You been good? It's been good. Very hot out there the last yeah, few no days. Yeah, no kidding. And uh, we are now, well, COVID-19 has been at us for a bit. Um, we are now into what, phase two here in Ontario, I think? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and stores are opening up and people are, are accepting appointments to, uh, to go check things out. Have you had a chance to get around to the stores? You know, I'm still like grocery store. That's my maximum destination right now. <laughs> so no, des no design shopping here. <laughs> There you go. Very yeah. good. Yeah, no, I noticed oh, that there's Home uh, Depot. Home Depot. Yeah, I've actually been there because I've been doing things uh, in my backyard uh, yeah. because I recognize that um, it's going to be spending a lot of my time this summer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So speaking of, of spending time, um, what's the one place you wish you could travel to right now? South of France. <laughs> nice. Love it. Nice. Yeah, I've been there once, yeah. a long, long, long time great ago. Great food, Beautiful place. great cheese, you get the ocean, you get the culture, you get the history, you have the mountains, you have the water. Ah. Well, I know <laughs> I know we can't get all of that in our backyard, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But we can get some of that. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely the destination right now. <laughs> All right, so speaking of destination uh, Puerto Backyarda, we've got some great guests on who are coming up today to talk to us about landscaping and what to do yes. on your deck and what to do in your backyard as to how you can make your, your backyard an amazing destination. So why don't we go ahead and introduce our panelists. Okay, so firstly, we're uh, so pleased to join with Ben Cullen. Uh, ben Cullen is a fourth generation gardener. Hi, Ben who works with his father, Mark Cullen, doing gardening, related media, growing trees, and promoting horticulture. On his own time, Ben is the founder of Cullen Foods, a food, a food business which connects consumers directly with farmers by operating transparent business model with a mind to local and global communities and environment. Welcome, Ben. Thank Welcome, you. Welcome, Ben. Good to have you. Thank you. All right, and our other guest today, today is Dave, and Dave is a certified and well-published landscape designer who is a passionate about removing the fear and guesswork out of the landscape process. So committed, in fact, that he created Just Ask Dave, a website that answers contractors and homeowners' questions. Dave, welcome to Design Conversations. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. So, how have things been in COVID? Well, for myself, things have been uh pretty busy now but for the first two months it was pretty slow um glad to be back out in the field and get my hands dirty yeah i think your industry was actually closed down for a while right yeah it was actually um we were right in the middle of of doing some hardscaping work uh, which we could do during the colder months mm -hmm. and uh and then when we got the shutdown it was just like now what um honestly it was uh, driving me up the wall a little bit but i understand <laughs> what uh what the policies and safety procedures were doing for everybody and and that yeah. actually got our our company back on track to uh instill new safety policies and new systems uh in order to keep our our company safe so when we got called back to work we were ready to go that's great and ben how things go for you well you know it started out as a bit of a crisis uh, as you probably know dad and i are very involved with canada blooms we were title sponsors this year by way of Mark's Choice, which is mm -hmm. Dad's line of gardening products. And Canada Blooms, if you don't know, North America's second largest indoor flower show. It's uh, co-located with the Home Show in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Cancelled the night before opening. So, I was there. I just can't imagine. Just yeah, a heartbreaker. 
an absolute yeah. heartbreaker. So that was sort of how COVID hit us first. And then it's been sort of a um, scramble ever since. My other business is a food business. Mm-hmm. I deal in uh, organic kidney beans, navy beans, black beans, which happen to be pantry loading items. So uh, it's a completely different kind of scramble, but uh, can't complain. Working from home, somewhat interrupt, uninterrupted, and um, yeah, we're getting by. It just has not been the spring that anybody anticipated, you know? Yeah, no kidding. So I, what I hear you guys saying is both had a bit of a pivot uh, around what happened, right? There's a something stopped, and I have to adjust and do something different. Big time. Big yeah, time. Yeah. Yeah. Said, it's least. been very positive because we've seen unprecedented demand for gardening, mm-hmm. Materials, gardening advice, the interest in backyard gardening has just, I haven't seen this sort of thing, certainly in my memory and for, for dad years and years, because people are at home, people are looking for stuff to do, and it's rewarding to get out there and, and get into the garden. Absolutely. I don't know. I, I noticed that uh, when we were looking for some plants for the backyard, um, it always felt like everything was either there was either there wasn't a lot there or was already picked through. And it was in my mind, it was like there's either been a rush or they haven't been able to actually bring it uh, to the stores just yet. Where what was what was going on? My understanding is I sit in on the uh, grower group uh, meetings with the Landscape Ontario, which is the provincial industry association, was um, holding back the temporary foreign workers, really disrupted demand mm-hmm. or rather supply, and then closing down the garden centers sort of created this bottleneck. And then when the garden centers opened. It was this rush of business like they'd never seen before under unusual circumstances, social distancing, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. Um, So it was like a blip and uh, they're catching up on the year, but certainly the supply interruption is the other side, which is labor related. So really unusual year. Right, right. And Dave, what's what's it been like for you now that you're back at it again? What What are some of the big things that your clients are asking for? Now, I know that you specialize mostly in, in landscape design. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the biggest things that were in demand uh, right out of the gate when people were allowed to get back into their backyards was swimming pools, uh, swimming pools and just uh, people more focused on keeping everything sustainable in their own backyard. So it came down to uh, during my time, during the slow time, online website called justaskdave.ca and it's ask me any question you want related to outdoor home improvement uh gardening uh construction anything it's free of charge uh just engages people about asking questions to get good answers uh mm-hmm. and some of those questions was about putting in swim pools do i have to put in a standard size 1632 or 1836 because that's what the norm had been for most people over the past a uh, few decades now and now what's really trending is uh, garden pools so 12 24s uh, actually I'll be doing one for myself like uh, 8 16 mm-hmm. uh, small intimate uh, settings um, because yards are getting smaller and smaller houses are right. getting bigger properties yeah. are getting a little smaller so pools was on the number one list um, mm-hmm. and then also people wanting to build in vegetable gardens uh, thinking that if there is ever going to be a second wave, they want to be ready mm-hmm. for all their fall harvest. And uh, so there was a lot of questions surrounding sustainable planting, as well as just keeping the backyard as the nucleus of the family. Right, right. And and being that you, um, you're doing a lot of the uh, design side of it as well, um, yeah. you know, Yasmin and I, we do interior design work. And it's like, are you seeing an extension from what I understand you're saying, you're seeing extension of what's happening in interior design, the way we separate space and how we use the space. Are we seeing that happening outside as well? Yeah, actually that's been really big. And and I had the privilege of oh, probably about 30 years ago when I started in this industry, I actually um, linked up with an interior designer who same philosophy was trying to express that indoor extension to the outdoors. So mm. I really adapted coining those phrases, like instead of a pool patio and deck, When I first started off, I was ghost designing for a pool company. Um, And the terminology back then was, oh, I want my pool, I would like a patio, and I'd like a deck. Mm -hmm. And quickly, that evolved for me into outdoor living room, outdoor dining area, outdoor kitchen space, Mm -hmm. uh, with some recreational play space for the kids. 
but people were really starting to get used to the outdoor rooms uh, as the extension of this. Sorry, cut off. What was that last thing I said? As extension of? As the extension of the indoor living space to the outdoors. Right, I got it. I got it. It definitely makes sense because you get to use, it suddenly multiplies the square footage usage of your yeah. home by creating this whole new environment in which you can explore and rest and be creative and just, uh, which is terrific as opposed to, you know, being in whatever square feet you have. Now, even if you have a small home and you have a good backyard, you, you've you now tripled really the size of your square footage. You know what, and that's an amazing point that you just made there because it took me years to convince people. I used to get um, a lot of homeowners and working uh, beside some interior designers. They would say, yeah, we're having difficulty helping a, a client see the the benefit of investing in the outdoors because they say, mm -hmm oh, there's only four good months in Canada. And mm -hmm. I would challenge them to say, well, first of all, let's look at the fact that uh, if you have an 1,800 or 200, uh, 2,000 square foot home indoors, but it's sitting on 7,500 square feet of lot space. And like myself, I'm paying 5,000 a year in property taxes. So the proportionate size of my yard, so let's say I'm about 8,000 8, square feet of lot space in an 1,800 square foot home. And I'm saying, no, I'm going to, value well for me my my personal space value by if i'm paying that property taxes and i'm only using one third of the actual lot footage that i have for indoor mm -hmm. i'm going to extend it to my outdoors and i help clients see how you could use that space but then how to get more than four months out of the year and right. that's involved by adding heaters heaters adding uh, fire pits, uh, outdoor screens and windbreaks and roof structures with infrared heaters. And now all of a sudden they're like, wow, I can be out here from April until the middle of December. So people are now utilizing that, um, those advantages now, those perks that are yeah. with outdoor design. Absolutely. I would say that prior to COVID, um, COVID-19, particularly here in Ontario with the cost of colleges going you know, quite high. Um, I, I feel like there has been this transition towards foregoing going and getting a cottage and actually investing that money into your backyard. Because if you think about it, although we may not have the four months of wanting to be able to spend outside comfortably, there are the odd, there is the odd day in February where it will hit 12, 13 degrees. And you're like, oh, it's so nice outside. You know, and you can't yeah. drive to a cottage, but you can certainly walk to 25 feet or 30 feet to your, your backyard and enjoy it a little bit. Well, and that's exactly right. I have actually clients in the middle of selling their cottages or had already planned on selling their cottage since last fall when mm -hmm. they had a conversation with me. And they just phoned me weeks after the lift or the ban on outdoor living. Mm -hmm. And what was happening is people were deciding to say, well, I just sold the cottage, Dave. I'm ready to invest in that design that you designed for us. Oh, that's amazing. Ago. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's gorgeous. That's we're, gorgeous. We're the other thing is, is how much of that uh, four months of good outdoor time do you want to spend on the 400 trying to get to cottage country? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They're spending four hours of their time going yeah. up north and four hours coming back. So they lose an entire day of that beautiful weekend. Mm -hmm. And people want uh, Porta Backyarda uh, yeah. or their Muskoka Cottage Backyard. And I'm yeah. finding more and more people are or actually they have that mentality. They say, well, I'm going to now save on the travel. I'm now going to save on spending more time. And they're, they're saving time. You can't buy time anymore, right? You know, it's, yeah. time is very valuable. One commodity they don't get back. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I, I read somewhere, and, and, I've, and I've applied this with a couple of my clients, but um, quite often people will want to put their barbecue, their deck, it's all attached to the house. And mm -hmm. what I've found now is that if you kind of want that feeling of getting away, even if your backyard is only 30 feet deep past your house, it's better to put everything as far from your house as possible so you can yeah. do everything back there and look towards your own home. It gives That's you right. more of a sense of having left. Would you say the same? Exactly. Actually, I, I do uh, I do SoundCloud um, uh, seminars, and one of them was looking at a yard from a different perspective. And I mm -hmm. actually take my clients and I ask them, let's grab some folding chairs or any chairs that they have in the backyard. We pick them up and I physically take them to either one back corner or the other or both just for them. We, we sit and have a conversation. And at first they look at me weird and they're like, okay, well, we're going to now 
take our furniture from our current patio and he's dragging us to the back of the yard. Soon as I sit them down and I purposely make them turn their backs to the negative views, which is usually second story neighboring backyard windows looking into sure. the yard. Now they can't even see them because of the six foot high neighbor friendly fence that they have. And I get them to face their own home. Their own home is a positive view, warm, fuzzy feeling. Mm -hmm. You can see people coming out of their own house. They don't have to worry about any other negative views. And mm -hmm. just like that, they're like, I didn't even see this before. So that is the different positive perspective that I'm always trying to educate my clients on looking at from a different perspective. I love that. I love that. Um, speaking of different perspective, uh, Ben, let's talk about ways to include food gardening into our yard. <laughs> well, you know, I was talking and when we talked about this earlier, I mentioned food gardening sort of historically was the ugly duckling of, mm -hmm. of backyard <laughs> gardening. It was something you kind of wanted out of view. Maybe you left it to grandma or your, your hippie daughter or something to look after. Um, but it's gotten really slick. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's foods that you can grow which are attractive to look at. You know, I mean, kale, for example. Now, yeah. I prefer growing kale to eating it, but there are people who eat it too. <laughs> and it comes in so many great shades and textures mm -hmm. that you can make an ornamental kale planting and, and pick from that, right? And, yeah. and to a passerby, they wouldn't even see the utility of it just for the, the purples and greens and grays that you can get, which are really well, cool. Well, they, they might graze so, on it too, though, right? Yeah. Yeah, they might too, if, they, if they're, so, if they're so, savvy. So actually, this is a... I never thought of that, but actually, instead of having the vegetable box where, you know, the raised thing, you can actually incorporate this between your flower beds, even as part of your. Yeah, uh, I mean, something you, like that. you can incorporate uh, with uh, floral arrangements, you know, put lavender in or whatever um, and, and in the way that you do the planting. You can also incorporate with with built structures, right? You can do raised beds, yeah. you can plant behind a retaining wall. Um, right. You can have planters with the garden herbs close to where you're preparing your meal. You know, that proximity, once once you're cooking with fresh herbs, it, there's mm -hmm. no going back. Um, Very true. And that alone, it's, it's the textures of the, the, the leaf material, the and herbs. The fragrance. The fragrance. Um, it's, you know, it's as good or better yes. than having a, a floral planter uh, in the same space, right? And mm -hmm. as you pick from it, it just continues to rejuvenate. So that's that's yeah. a way that people are certainly incorporating more. I, I live in the city. And uh, even though I live in the city, I still have bunnies, so many bunnies. And they find oh. my veggies and my plants and uh, whatever, you know, they, they feel desirous for. How, how can I control that? Well, I, I are also there live plants that they don't like for us to consider planting. <laughs> you can try all sorts of different remedy. I, my having gardened both in the country and in town, I find the the animal pressure in town, the bunnies and the squirrels, much mm. much much worse uh, oh. because in the country there's so much more predator, right? Um, so I mean, there's different remedies you can try um, for sure. I think the most effective, however, if you're willing to invest in it, is a physical barrier. And huh. um, you can get, I don't know, if you ever bring baking to a picnic, you, you know those like those uh, spherical nets you kind of put on top of your baking so the flies won't land on it? Yeah, mm -hmm. almost like a cloche, a permeable cloche. Um, you can get similar structures to go over your raised beds, uh, to go over your planters, and often they're hinged. So you simply lift them up to access the crop. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's a really tidy, essentially 100% effective way to deal with that type of uh, chemical, chemical free as well. So chemical free, which is a big thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's what we're doing more and more of. Uh, my veggie garden, I have the luxury of being able to hide it around the side of my house. So the only place I can see it from is the bedroom window, and I like looking at it. Uh, so we're doing more and more row I love, cover. I love looking at them. <laughs> and Personally, I mean, you with, a, with a design eye, granted, so... Uh, row yeah. covers aren't always the most beautiful, you know, it's no. like a fabric, <laughs> uh, but that's another really effective means and economical. Yeah. yeah. And there are, there are no bylaws in the city of Toronto around gardens, are there? Uh, to vegetable gardens, none that I know of. In fact, um, there's a new program in Toronto. It's called Food Up Front mm -hmm. and Liberating Lawns. There's two. And they're both uh, food justice, food access initiatives. 
connecting growers to landowners. And the idea is to get more productive crops growing where there would otherwise be lawn. And um, uh, it's quite an interesting initiative. And um, there certainly hasn't, to my knowledge, been any regulatory uh, pushback by law limitations to it. Keeping livestock, yes. <laughs> you can right. keep chickens Chicken. in the city of Guelph, where I live. Yeah. It's a lot more complicated in front. You need right. good neighbors. All right, so speaking about lawns, um, obviously there are alternative coverage to lawns, to grass, if you will. Uh, Dave, how about you give us a, a, a quick um, chat about uh, synthetic lawns versus uh, natural lawns? Uh, and yeah, and <laughs> so uh, years ago when it was first kind of on the rise, um, it was more of a, I'm going to call it like a fake AstroTurf. It didn't look mm -hmm. really attractive. People were actually putting it over their concrete patios. Um, and it kind of made, I guess, the, give the illusion of green space. I, I wasn't really fond of it. As the years grew on, no pun intended, um, mm -hmm. I, I watched on the uh, frontage there, uh, artificial grass and landscaping was introducing here in Canada a synthetic turf that was so realistic looking. Like I even would take my flip flops off at the time and I would actually stand on it. And I'd say, oh my like, goodness, this is like, feels like real grass between my toes. My wife would have nothing to do with it. And at the time when we were publishing out uh, some blogs about uh, real versus fake, yeah. um, she actually walked into their, their storefront, took off her flip flops. We just got back from the Dominican, it was February. And she's looking at me and she's like, Dave, take your flip flops off. And I said, yeah, I know it's, it's good, but you've hated this. So we've never introduced it in our own backyard. It is amazing stuff. It looks great. Uh, it feels and looks like real grass, uh, except it doesn't come with the maintenance that comes with, um, you know, weed control. Uh, the amount of watering that would be involved in lawn care is, is crazy. Um, you know, it's so noticeable that one year I did an experiment where I didn't even turn on my sprinkler system. The next season, I decided to put it on. Within the first 30 days, I get a phone call from this from the uh, utilities and said, oh, do you have a leak? Last year versus this year, you, you're consuming a lot of water. So even getting that phone call from a uh, wow. utility company made me realize it is that noticeable wow. that you're going to get a phone call from your utility saying, do you have a leak? You're using an excessive amount of water than you did the prior year. Um, so artificial turf does have its benefits. It has its uh, uses. Um, I have clients that um, are so much into their short game of golf that introducing now lawn backyards into putting green. Yeah. Um, for those that With take the, the golf. So where the putting green is, they would put the artificial turf? Yep, yep. So there's I, uh, I assume you get it in different lengths. Is that the idea? Yeah. So in, in the photograph that you're seeing uh, on the screen now, the this gentleman his golf so much that half his backyard of the remaining grass is actual play space for the children and the dog half is this uh putting green area um that is 100 percent synthetic so there's no no watering to do because if you had real bent grass and we've mm -hmm. done some actual real bent grass putting green in uh in um larger estate properties the amount of watering that is involved in keeping those greens proper are almost well it's almost like three times a day really uh, oh, wow. and mowing mowing three times a week to to mm -hmm. maintain that uh short short bent grass that you used to put on mm -hmm. but now you do that with artificial for me uh when i do get clients that are w not wanting the maintenance don't want to spend the excessive amount of water that would be involved in real lawn expect it, it, only if you have trees if you have perimeter trees you want to keep those watered if you have perimeter gardens mm -hmm. that you can integrate both vegetables and perennials to create a florific and sustainable edible garden you need water but then go drip irrigation over spray head irrigation but yeah artificial turf has now got a place for itself uh, i see it okay Great. So for Love those it. people who who want to put like who are going to be putting some uh, plants and bushes, Ben, uh, you I know we should be considering what plants will grow well in our climate and what might consume less water and thrive in our in in our kind of an environment. Uh, is there yeah. a recommendation for what people should be thinking of? Well, there is, and you know, I was I was going to add on to the lawn point as well because I guess I build myself as an environmentalist. I'm not 
really all that offended by the synthetic lawn because a uh, conventional lawn is pretty environmentally burdensome by any measure. Mm -hmm. It's the water, it's also the fertilizer, uh, and it takes a tremendous amount of energy to produce fertilizer, uh, lawn fertilizer. So wow. there's there's lawn alternatives, like uh, I'm seeing more and more people, they want like a flowering lawn, they want to see pollinators in the lawn. Uh, yeah, the flowers that kind of creep it. along the, the grass really, really low. Yeah. There's low clover. English daisies, clover, exactly. And the benefit to the clover is it's a legume, it, it fixes nitrogen out of the atmosphere. So it largely eliminates the need for a nitrogen fertilizer and it'll keep that green up throughout the season. So that's in the lawn. Uh, but in the perimeter, the gardens around the lawn, certainly we're seeing sort of a sustained shift uh, first, away from annuals, like those color popping annuals, the impatience that were popular once upon a time. I'd say hydrangea have really replaced um, the kind of color pop perennials. Dave probably confirmed that from a design standpoint. Um, but the next wave of more, uh, say, ambitious, educated, environmentally concerned gardeners is certainly natives, which have been around for literally forever. The definition is. It's a species that existed in North America pre-settlement. Um, and there's a lot of great native species that are literally evolved to our environment. And, um, you know, things like purple coneflower um, or echinacea, uh, black-eyed Susans, you've seen them before, uh, but where they're starting to garner more credit is just how low maintenance they are and how drought tolerant they are and uh, how reliable they are. Of course, being perennials come back every season, so it's more or less a one-time investment you split them um and as when do you more... split them when when do you split them spring or fall so most of the horticulture like if you're just gardening uh, most of the horticulture societies would have their uh, plant sales in may uh, mm -hmm. under regular circumstances and that's a really good time to put your split your perennials or buy perennials um or in the fall and um Manual. I was just going to say, you're splitting perennials. Um, is it the same time of year you want to actually trim your trees and your shrubs back to? Is it the spring and the fall? Uh, yeah, it kind of depends on when they flower, but generally, yeah, early spring, your roses, for example, late winter, early spring, uh, you want to get the pruning done. Okay. Yeah, good point. And so, and I, so I the cherry tree that's just going crazy on me, it's going so, so, so tall. And I've been thinking about trying to trying to prune it because every year all those cherries they fall all over our deck and you can imagine it's just red yeah. and it's just it's a mess all the time walking it on is it. a mess yeah so it'll, so it'll stand it. up to a pretty pretty rough pruning yeah so prune it in the spring you're saying uh uh sorry you said it was cherry cherry yeah yeah you can do that early spring all before right. it puts on new growth but the um and the and the other thing that's driving this trend to uh the natives of course is the concern around biodiversity start start with the pollinators but now we realize you know this is this is a food this is a web right mm -hmm. it's birds that feed on pollinators it's everything because uh, we've also seen bird populations in steep steep decline and there's different theories for that but plant selection really makes all the difference and um, what we found with a lot of the exotics like Japanese maple for example it's basically sterile and people have loved them for years because they have so little insect pressure but by not supporting insects, they also don't support birds. And they don't really have a lot of ecological carrying capacity, right? Okay. But native species like a red bud is still going to give you fantastic color in the spring. It'll grow, take roughly the same footprint as a Japanese maple, but it's it's a native species. So you'll see it alive with pollinators during the, the spring flowering season, for example. How, how can you discover these plants? Like, I mean, sometimes we're just like victims of what the, the nurseries that we go to. And, and they don't always share that knowledge with you so that you know what, what to pick and, and support for that biodiversity. So if you're shopping at a good independent nursery, like around Toronto, you've got Sheridan Nurseries, uh, Terra Nurseries, um, they will often have their native species merchandise together or their staff would be able to identify them for you. You can also go to um, Carolinian Canada is a big, uh, campaign kind of partner with World Wildlife Fund. We live in the Carolinian zone in most of Southern Ontario. And uh, the Carolinian zone is a biodi biodiverse region uh, that was all kind of hardwood forests, basically from Toronto to Windsor. And much of that's been cleared, right? 
So we're talking about the native maple trees and oak species. And um, there's a ton of great resources online of the types of trees, shrubs, plants you should be looking for. Pardon my ignorance, yeah, but when great. you say- uh, I just learned something new today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's learning great. lots of new. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question. It's going to show you I'm really learning something new. Uh, when it comes to zones, uh, what zone are we? Two, three, four? How does that fall into that? We're basically a zone five here. Zone five. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming our audience is all mostly southern Ontario. I think so. Toronto. Yeah, I mean, if you get close, you get up around Barrie, it drops to a four. Four uh, and the 5A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, and 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 wherever you're shopping, assuming you're shopping locally, they're going to be mm -hmm. selling zone appropriate plant material. Got um, it. Got yeah. It. Okay. Um, there is this trend towards more of the, uh, as you say, exotics, but you know the palms and the broadleaf plants, those sorts of things. You know, it's kind of. I mean, I, I love that stuff personally. Um, well, that stuff is that stuff that we we do want to put outside, or should we just keep that stuff to, to inside and keeping it away from uh, an outside ecosystem? I like putting my indoor house plant, my tropicals, my indoor plants outside for the summer, provided okay. they're in the right place. And there's no harm in having them there. Uh, it's more a question of opportunity cost. So if you're not replacing, you know, just, there's no harm. They're not spreading anything negative, nefarious. Um, and there's a benefit for the most part. Uh, provided you know you don't shock them, you don't move them out too quickly, and uh, that you're kind of thoughtful to what is this plant's native environment and how do I replicate that here? So, for example, like um, your orchids uh, and bromeliads, they're kind of like understory uh, epiphytic plants. They live on trees in the rainforest, so they're like kind of indirect sunlight, high humidity. Um, uh. So it's it helps to kind of Educate yourself a bit on the types mm -hmm. of plants you've got in your home and uh, not put them in the blazing sun uh, mm -hmm. and let them get scorched or move them out too soon because typically they're very temperature sensitive <laughs> at the low end. So yeah. I guess that's great information yeah. for, for people as well who perhaps live in condos where they really just yeah. have an outdoor deck where they can't um, have soil that would survive the winter that would freeze. It's good to know that they're indoor plants and put them outside for that time being. Totally. I have scorched an orchid or two. I, I scorched one this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's easy to do. I've done it. And uh, no shame. I mean, gardening is a, it's a passion of repeated failures and learnings, right? Uh, that's the fun part. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. When you stop killing plants, you've won. Find a new hobby. Don't put the rest yeah. of us to shame. <laughs> That's good. That's nice. I like that. But, I think we have a poll. Don't we have a poll that we wanted to share with everyone? Yes, we do. Uh, we we thought we'd throw in some uh, polls yeah, let's and go ahead and post get up. some engagement with our viewers. So we'll go ahead and share the results with you uh, after this is done. But it's actually, will you be spending more time in your backyard than in 2019? If so, how much more? None right. at all. <laughs> I've already spent as much time as possible. 25%, 50%, or 100%. Well, I guess we don't get to vote. So panelists, we don't get to vote. Just FYI, apparently it's not a... <laughs> Um, All right. Yeah. Okay. So, have you guys spending more? Have you guys been spending more time in your backyards? I certainly have been. Yes. Yeah, me too. We've been we've been spending loads of time. And I was gonna, you know, I know you're an interior designer. I was gonna make a point about indoor plants and the outdoors. Sure. Um, because a lot of times the indoor environment is not very hospitable to a lot of these tropical plants. And when we say they're shade tolerant or low light tolerant, it just means that often they'll die more slowly there. So like a spathophyllum, for oh, example, no. <laughs> the great indoor plant or a banana tree or a yeah. palm, you know, it, it can handle the indoor environment because it'll die very slowly. So actually using <laughs> the spring, summer oh, no. closer to natural light is a good way to reinvigorate them so that, yeah. you know, when the growth slows down, the days get short and you move them back indoors. They're healthy and strong going into the fall because then you could really benefit from indoor plants throughout the season. Oh, so my allocations, I needed my elephant plants. I need to take outside yeah. right now. Is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> or at least and get them fall. closer to outside. And the yeah, get some green in the, the leaves, sugar in the roots. Yeah. Oh, that's so sad. Okay. <laughs> um, when we were talking with you, Dave, uh, the other day in our prep, uh, you mentioned this new trend of the wall partitions. 
Mm -hmm. uh, that people, there's all kinds of beautiful solutions that people can create privacy or spaces between, even within the spaces of your yard. Yeah, uh, some people that. are dealing with limited spaces of uh, planting space. So as the yards are getting a lot smaller, and let's say they're trying to put a swim pool and they have these five foot offsets, and then it doesn't leave them so much for planting, but at least they want to create some privacy either from their neighbor or from creating the outdoor rooms that they're using uh, wall partitions. I mean, uh, 18 years ago, I built this cedar lattice behind me and it still stands, but now there's plasma cut steel. So you can plasma cut uh, floral or um, leaf emblems to look like leaves falling through and then they shine light from behind that steel screen. Mm -hmm. So now you're getting effects in the evening. Uh, you're getting no maintenance wow. whatsoever. Um, Corten steel, which rusts mm -hmm. orange, is a very dramatic pop in the landscape. But then also when people are building structures, they're now using blinds that can roll down, whether it's bamboo, uh, oh. stuff that, that is actually durable for outdoors. Sometimes they have synthetic looking bamboo, so they're made out of a, uh, a polymer or vinyl, and it just looks like a rattan style um, rollout screen. So these are things that people are using for windbreaks, uh, visual barriers, and just to sort of mitigate noise or sound. Um, let's say from traffic driving by so yeah that's that sounds amazing that sounds really beautiful mm -hmm. yeah uh in in uh some of the different things that people are being that you're being asked to create in people's yards what would you say are people going for like more water features like waterfalls or are they focused on, I know there's also a very big trend and I'm jumping all over a bit, but uh, with the whole outside kitchen, uh, adding that in, uh, do people really need, how much space does someone need to create that outdoor kitchen? Um, okay, so let's, let's look at defining what the use of space is for a family. So when I come in and people say, I want a landscape, I actually, I don't jump into designing the potential space right away. I actually sit down and I have this getting to know you, mm -hmm. you know, what is your favorite food? What restaurants do you love to go? What's your favorite travel? Ah. If you, if you have an opportunity to take your children somewhere, where would it be that you would want them to see or be influenced? Maybe it was from your childhood past that you were taken on a trip or a journey. And once they start revealing, once my clients start telling me their passions, they're, they're things that make them happy. Um, I listen and I start defining, okay, it sounds like you were taken always to the waterfall uh, trails along the Bruce Trail and you sat and you meditated or you love to have a picnic by a waterfall. So then let's in introduce a water feature in your backyard. Whereas I get some clients, I would say, uh, I love a very uh, uh, streamlined, minimalistic type of space, but I love to entertain a lot. Oh, mm -hmm. well, let's focus on an outdoor kitchen for you and your family because kitchens are the nucleus to conversation, gatherings, parties, and events. So at that point, I, I try to get an understanding from one client that they are very organic, earthy, they need nature around them, they need to see natural stone, they need to see water, they need to see plants and even a fire element so you can extend your outdoor living in the cooler months. But then I get some clients that say, we are business owners. We have a lot of gathering, excuse me, a lot of gatherings that involve get togethers at least 10 to 15 times a year. Mm -hmm. um, we bring caterers in to, that come in and actually help, uh, help run our parties. So I need an area where the bartender is going to be i need an area to cook but i need it for tapas because we don't have room for sit down dining it's more of the move and pick so you have the little wow, plate there's so many so many yeah. things yeah so i find it that when i i'm trying to understand my client's lifestyle use mm -hmm. then i start to inspire them with some sort of design and it could be water feature fire table it could be outdoor living room it could be outdoor kitchen so it's it's just trying to understand what their needs are first. Yeah, yeah. There's, great, there's, there's an investment into the personality of the client, right? 
<laughs> yeah. All right, so we've got another poll we want to send out, uh, poll question number two. And while that's going out, uh, Yasmin's going to talk a little bit about our sponsors. Just a few minutes, it's just a, a one minute, actually. A special thanks sure. again to our sponsors, Constantino, Fisher and Paykel, Lixel Group, Kentwood, through Metropolitan Floors. Thank you for pivoting with us from in-person to these online events. If you are planning on creating an outdoor kitchen, please take a moment to discover Fisher and Paykel sister company, DCS, for their amazing quality and endurance from grills to refrigeration, definitely a must. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Arthur. Right, quick poll is, do you plan to grow fruit and or vegetables this year? Uh, yes, I grow fruit and vegetables every year. Yes, this is the first year I'm going to grow vegetables, herbs only, and no, herbs only. Dave, we're going to get into um, a quick round, uh, a fire round of questions. Before we do, though, they say herbs. Um, can you talk to us a bit about cannabis? Yeah, actually, it's uh, interesting. Since the legalization, um, uh, the cannabis has uh, been invited into backyards. And uh, conversations around that, which years prior, I had very few clients ever uh, approach me and say, hey, do you know how to grow it? Do you know mm -hmm. how to uh, bring it into a backyard? Do you know where I can get plants? Um, now, like since it was interesting because when I was sitting waiting for my opportunity to go um, and actually be able to go back out in the field and do construction, my Just Ask Dave was blowing up on my Instagram and on my website. People were asking about herbs, vegetables, and cannabis. And it was almost as equally in asking how to grow it, where to get it, um, mm -hmm. because they know that they can grow. I, now, I'm still trying to get the straight answer if it's two plants or four plants per household. But uh, cannabis does have a, a place, especially for people that are looking at it as a medicinal side mm -hmm. of it. And most of my clients in their mid 40s to early 50s who have been asking me, and they're professionals, they're business owners and they're dentists or CFOs of companies. And they say, you know, my arthritis has been kicking in and I can relate. I'm 51 years old. Mm -hmm. When I wake up on a cold, you know, January, February, and the bones of my hands are starting to feel a little bit achy. Um, it's nice to find uh, the brand I'll say, or the, the strain that mm -hmm. works for people to allow them to function during the day and, and maybe not put them to sleep. So, you know, people that want more of that uppity, I need to get stuff done. They plant a sativa plant. Mm -hmm. And when it, it uh, female grows to bud and that bud becomes harvestable, um, whether they want to turn that into an edible form. So there's take the flour, put it right. in butter or put it in coconut oil and you can use it for cooking. Sure. For those that like to smoke the herb, uh, it helps with um, keeping them motivated, keep them alert, but also mitigate some pain. Mm -hmm. um, depends on the strains for them. So yeah, I've been getting yeah. a lot of questions from clients and asking <clears throat> where can I get the plants and, and or can I grow them from seed and how do I sex a plant? So I teach them how to do that. Okay. Then are you finding the same? That have, has that been something that through you, you've been seeing more requests on? And where can people find more information to plant yeah. those? Um, certainly we've had more requests and uh, I mean I worked at a garden center all through university we kind of there was always the euphemisms people would come in like oh I'm growing tomatoes this is February right <laughs> um, <laughs> are they green tomatoes yeah yeah green tomatoes <laughs> and uh, tomatoes actually a, a perfect euphemism because the needs are almost exactly the same so right, right. You know, I'll, I'll be honest I don't have any experience growing it personally but you know mm -hmm. I understand the plant how it grows mm -hmm. and if you can grow a tomato you can grow pot so in fact it grows cannabis. a lot more <laughs> cannabis and go. it grows a lot more vigorously so you know i think the question just becomes where you have full sun where uh you're not necessarily um perhaps ashamed or whatever to have it like you don't want it on the front lawn maybe but if you've got a full sun <laughs> well, spot people might steal it <laughs> well, no, it, it's yeah, i was just gonna say the stigma the balance. stigma is still there i get people who yeah every person in in any subdivision can grow it legally without mm -hmm. repercussions of it being ripped out even due to complaint how uh, can you tell if you have a male or a female and how, like you know you were mentioning you have to have a female and a male only the female plants are value like work yeah. so how how can 
So and there's I'm a little sort of little flower, there's little... a little flower calyx, and and at the base of a stem, it actually looks like a little letter V, two little stigma, uh, uh, the the pollen that comes out of the calyxes. So it represents a little V for the female, and then for the male, uh, just as it's going to produce uh, or go into its uh, uh, sex plant, it, it, like little balls, they're just like hanging at the base of the stem. So you can sex the plant by finding that if they're not there's no balls on them. It's a female. No <laughs> balls it. on them. It's a male. Oh, wow. Okay. So. Well, on that note, why don't we jump into our, our next round? Uh, this is our, our rapid fire question round. I'm just going to throw out some questions out there and uh, let's just get through this real quick. We're going to give ourselves maybe 30 seconds to 60 seconds per question and then sure. we'll just run through this. Okay. Um, then after this, we're going to uh, um, take some questions from our participants. I so, for participants that are out there, uh, this is great. If you haven't done so already, uh, go ahead and submit uh, some questions um, via the uh, via the via the interface here, and we'll get into that. Sorry, Yasmin, go ahead. No, just just to get maybe right after that, we can hear the results of those polls. Sure, awesome, awesome. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, so rapid uh, question. first question is: uh, <laughs> grass or artificial turf? <laughs> Dave. <laughs> Well, you know what? I, I've always loved the real grass, but uh, artificial turf has its place for, let's put it this way. If you want no maintenance, artificial uh -huh. turf. All right, if Ben. You, if, you, if you love rolling in the grass, you got pets, you got kids, you want play space, let go for the real lawn. Okay. I say uh, flowering lawn alternative, clovers, <laughs> English days, potentilla. I love it. Let's get a list of great alternatives from you for like later that. on, too. All <laughs> right. All right, here we go. So we've been in quarantine for a while. What's this is a crazy question? What's the one plant you would not? Uh, sorry, did I put the right? What's the one plant <laughs> you would not quarantine without? Oh, without. Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> one plant. Dave or do you want garlic? One, go ahead. I, I, I need garlic. garlic. I need garlic. I need garlic. garlic. <laughs> we have the same <laughs> answer. I need, yeah, I need my garlic. I, uh, you know, cannabis is, yeah, it, it helps with wonders, especially when you want to mitigate pain and sleep. Uh -huh. But if it's about cooking and your senses and herbal and medicinal, mm -hmm. garlic is my number one love of herb. Basil and garlic. Yeah. I, with that, funny, Dave. I fully agree with you. We should have a barbecue. And I, and the thing oh, too yeah. is, homegrown garlic eats anything you'll find at the grocery store. Oh yeah. It's yeah. So much more flavor. Yeah, right. I agree. High five, Ben. High five. <laughs> there you go. It's, would that be the two most popular herbs that people want to plant themselves? Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. I, I, I think I get a lot of requests for, well, I get some people that are into culinary backyard grilling. They love their oregano, yeah. basil, mm -hmm. uh, garlic, um, chives, you know, stuff that's really good, fast and easy to pluck out of the garden, chop it up and throw it into a even when you grab a little sprig of, of um, tarragon or uh, thyme or oregano and you throw it in a cast iron pan on a grill, you just it, you get the flavor that just pops right out of it. Wow. Um, I Burst. love my grilling. Yeah. Yeah. And right okay. now you're getting the garlic scapes, which you wouldn't get at the grocery store. If you did, no. you'd be paying through the nose for it. Yeah. Them. And those are amazing to have too. Garlic All right. scape pesto. I think I know the answer, but uh, zero scape or lush and green? Lush and green. Lush and green over here. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Pool or hot tub? You can't have both. Ooh, hot tub. <laughs> Neither. I, I, I go for the hot. Well, I've had both. I've had both. And and I guess it would just go to say my wife uh, would prefer a hot tub because um, when it comes down to at one o'clock or two o'clock in the morning, glass of wine and the kids are in bed, the hot tub is where it's at. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up with both, and I'd say neither. I don't like swimming. I'd rather have a pond with fish in it, and <laughs> I'd look at that personally. Who is this Ben guy? He's making up his own answers. He's like stepping right outside. He's doing his own thing. All right, that's okay. I, I can handle that. I actually, I think I would probably do a pool, um, but I do one of those small pools, you know, 12 by 12, 14 by 14, um, and it'd be a saltwater pool. Um, and I, I just want to wade when it's really, really hot. It's kind of nice to hang out. <laughs> So swim spa is where it's at for you. Ah, there you swim go. Spa, yeah, actually, that's the that's my goal. End game goal is I'm gonna build a eight by sixteen in ground swimming pool, but I'm gonna get two custom hot tub covers for it so that we can 
crank up the heat and probably run it right until December. Oh, great idea. question, which nice is relevant. Idea. Dave, have you gotten any requests for swim ponds? Yes, I've had swim ponds. We've built one uh, that was in the Hager. What's a Hager. swim pond? Hang on, is that for the it's, salmon? So the salmon has a current to go no, against? You can, you can actually swim in it. Now, yeah. like the, uh, there's, there's, so the one that we built was actually with an uh, Aquascape's biofiltration system. They use the Grande, but the proper swim uh, ponds, the filter system is actually like a marsh. So uh, you, have, okay. you have almost one third of the surface area that is just marsh only that acts as your natural filter and the other two-thirds is swimmable but you can also have fish life and frogs and turtles and oh. around there but uh chemical one, free yeah the one we built in a residential backyard which almost occupied two-thirds of their backyard they yeah. wanted to have koi they wanted to be able to sit uh lap level so the water would come up to their lap um and because we didn't have enough room to overextend the marsh type of biofilter so aquascapes had put out a the grande biofilter because what it is is it it, it uh, breeds the bacteria that's good that eats the nitrates out of the water so you don't get a lot of algae and string algae but yeah it was uh, quite fascinating when i had that request and i really immersed myself into the the biogenetics behind it all and and uh, bioengineering um and it was fascinating that it was a very clean pond and they they thrived uh, well with their fish life and also the joy of themselves being able to swim. Dave, can we see that somewhere? Do you, is it on your website? I'd love to see that. No, no, that was going back. Uh, so I've been in 30 years, so it was probably about five years into business. And it was, okay. I, I would love, yeah, actually, I got to go back though, because I'm pretty sure it's still standing there. Yeah, you know, it'd be amazing. The region. Yeah. Should we right. get in some participant questions from Joel? Yeah, sure. I just want to. I just want to. I just want to get uh, one last quick question here. Um, this is a question that we're asking all our participants. It's this. Uh, so, what has this industry taught you? And if you could talk to an 18-year-old self, what would you tell yourself about the industry? Hmm. Keep it short and sweet, though. Ask lots of questions. Okay. Ask lots of questions. Love what yes. you do because it's a lot of hard work. Don't do it for the money. Just do it for because you love it. And that's 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 been my path. I love what I do and and uh, it's yeah, it was not about the if I could have done it for I would have been a, a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been a surgeon. Yeah. Two wonderful answers. Thank All right, you. thank you. All right, so let's jump into those participant questions. Uh, Joelle's been um, going through the questions and she's going to read out some questions from our participants and uh, they'll be directed to both Ben and Dave. All right, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, I will first share the results. It's a good time of our polls. Thank you. So I'm gonna share the results of spending more time in your backyard this year. So, oh, no, wrong one. This is, are you gonna plant, uh, fruits that's and vegetables. Right. So that's Nobody, pretty amazing. Twenty three percent are planting vegetables for the first time this year. That's amazing. So that's that's really cool that's to find great. out. Uh, you nineteen percent who aren't planting anything. Okay, well that's fine. I'm sorry, nineteen percent. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, nineteen <laughs> percent. Um, Maybe next and year. And we see that uh, forty percent of people are going to be spending double the amount of time they were in their backyard last year. Wow. Surprise. Yeah. Surprise. 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 Yeah. Yeah. All yes. right. Well, that's fun. Oh, uh, that's great. All right. Let's hear from our okay. participants. So there was a couple questions that we had from Melissa and Denise about artificial turf. So they're wondering about when it comes to like to um or actually I had a, two different questions. So in terms of artificial turf, are there different qualities and materials and grades that you can get? Yes. Yeah, there's uh, uh, many different grades out there, but I guess it depends on application. If you want something that is, uh, the children are in their uh, gymnastics, let's say, um, you can actually get an artificial turf and or sports turf. So let's look at, the families that have athletes, um, soccer, gymnastics, uh, uh, anything that does a lot of treading on, you supplement that kind of artificial turf with a rubber granular into it, so it mitigates uh, impact 
um, and just makes it a little bit easier to play on. But if you also want to have pets or you want to be in the putting, then you're going to go with a, a short um, knitted turf, uh, easier for picking up the number twos and easy to play play ball on or bocce ball on. So mm. there's different grades. Again, it all depends on application. I'm doing a job right now in Port Dalhousie. The front yard is going to look like real grass to a point that that type of artificial turf even has thatch in it. So you look at it, you'll see wow. green grass and actually little brown thatch pieces are in it. So it looks so realistic. And then the back side of the house that has for the pets, it's a pet friendly turf. So it's very short and easy to pick up the, the poops off of uh, with a little pooper scooper. So it um, depends on the, the, the use. So there's okay, any grades. other questions, Shua? Thank you, Dave. Yes, Karen is asking, what is a good climber for a brick wall? The brick wall is my view from my living room and we would like a living wall type of effect for as many seasons as possible. However, we don't want anything that will cause damage to the wall. Any suggestions? Ben? I would just go with Virginia Creeper because it's so aggressive. <laughs> you can count on it, it's native. Um, whether or not it would cause damage, you just got to keep it under control. Um, like there's a lot of these vines, depends on sort of the integrity of your brickwork. Vine, climbers can be tough on things, but if you cut it back aggressively every year, um, certainly there's benefits, there's cooling benefits, right? This is bringing moisture up the wall, it keeps the sun, direct sunlight off. So um, yeah, that's what I recommend, Virginia Creeper. Dave? Uh, for yeah, I, 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 it's a good it's a good aggressive uh, vine for all seasons. Like if they don't want to see any change, uh, English ivy, which is a broadleaf mm -hmm. evergreen, usually can last. I I'm I've been accustomed to see it around the the grounds of McMaster University. It's quite beautiful. But whether it's Virginia creeper, whether it's English ivy, whether it's going to be any type of tendril mm -hmm. style clinger that gets into the brick mortar, it, it doesn't matter anytime. So I have to agree with Ben and it, it's, it's maintenance, it's maybe rejuvenation. So give the brick an opportunity to get to breathe. So trim it back, cut it back, it'll regrow. But if you leave it for decades, the moisture that comes from the shading and the mm -hmm. tendrils that get into the brick mortar start uh, dissolving or devouring the brick mortar it just crumbles it apart so you have to get back in there with a stone mason and repaint wow. it oh wow so, okay yeah so it's a great look but you have to be really careful yeah mm -hmm. yeah a friend, a friend of and, mine bought a house and um her mother-in-law came to help them with uh grooming some of the greens and so um she snipped uh just one of the branches really close to the base thinking it was just a small Ooh. section um within yeah. three weeks the entire side of the house went brown yeah oh so, yeah yeah start out and work in maybe yeah yeah, yeah. 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 climbing hydrangeas are also beautiful oh plants. i love climbing hydrangea yeah, yeah. love the climbing cool. hydrangea. yeah I've, I've right, we are actually just, well, just to keep track of the time we're actually at 4 p.m right now so technically we're we're at the end uh joelle do we have any more questions that uh they're out there to, to, that we can ask we do have some more questions if Dave and Ben wouldn't mind spending a little bit more time with us, but sure. I don't know if you guys want to, you know, kind of just give your final tips to anybody that has to leave at 4 p.m. Uh, for their for their backyard and just for their living, like your number one tip for living outside, having your best life outside in your backyard before uh, before people have to shut up, sign off. All right, to recap. What's your top advice for having your best life in your backyard? <laughs> uh, I would say get out there, get dirty, make mistakes, grab the plants at the garden center that interest you, and um, keep going, keep growing, and you'll, it's amazing what you'll learn. Uh, I think my entire life surrounds good food, good wine. So if you have room to put in a grill, you have room to plant some vegetable plants, especially root vegetable plants that you can harvest in the, the fall time. The experience of plucking something out of your own garden mm -hmm. and grilling it onto your barbecue and inviting others in that backyard a little outdoor kitchen and little sustainable vegetable garden that you can easily maintain yourself with herbs and root vegetables is an amazing experience. To, for those that even have no clue 
it, it, it's, it's not that difficult to grow vegetables and it's not that difficult to cook on an outdoor grill because even a little bit of char uh, makes you look like a chef. It's not a mistake, <laughs> but it's, it, it, yeah, it's, food is passion, food is life. Right. And I think if you could do it, do it with an outdoor kitchen. Cool. I'm with you. I'm with you both. If I had wine, I'd be toasting you guys right now. <laughs> <laughs> Home office, it should be right at that. All uh, right, so if everyone wants, if uh, if people would like to stick around, stick around. We're going to stay on for another 10 minutes. Is that okay, guys? Yeah, And we'll address fine. some of these questions, and then we'll close it down. So those who have to go, okay. thank you so much for joining us. It was great to have you here, and we'll uh, be in touch with you with uh, future dates and future episodes. And those who are sticking around, uh, let's continue on, Joelle. Do you want to just start, do you want to just uh, thank the people, just in case people sign off? Shall we start? thank HPG, James, and Annie, and just in case people sign up, no? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, okay, so just in case people are signing off, just a quick thank you again uh, for joining us for the design conversations, and special thanks to Holmes Publication Group, Annie uh, Bogovit, the coordinator with HPG and us, James Lopi for uh, the production coordination, we couldn't do it without you. And special thanks to our Joelita, who uh, also created a wonderful herbish drink, uh, which we've posted as well here uh, for you to enjoy with cucumber and basil and all kinds of yummy things. So go ahead, go on our web, go on the link and grab it and enjoy it. And we want to thank everybody for uh, joining us for this third episode and the fourth episode will be July 7th where we're going to continue the conversation of outdoor design and Joelle please continue with more questions from people <laughs> okay I will thank you um okay so um one person had a question of where do you find the metal cutouts for the floral designs for a privacy screen? Uh, you can go online and just Google it, but uh, one of the closest resources here in Canada, Guelph, I believe they're out of Guelph, is Iconic Screen. So Iconic, uh, I believe is spelled I-C-O-N-I-K, Iconic screen the plasma cut they're manufactured here in canada they have all their own patented little designs um and i refer them quite a bit and they've made my clients very happy uh quality is good they don't do the installation so they usually call us back to do <clears throat> installation but they can design anything and it if you even want something custom let's say there's something that is uh very memorable for you whether it's a family member or just some sort of scene or memory that is uh, very personal to somebody they can actually uh plasma cut that into a screen and you have it for the rest of your life and hand it down Beautiful. to generations yeah it's very cool thank you um, Joelle, another you question that we have is what is the best type of ornamental grass that grows tall but narrow mm. tall but narrow mm. Hmm. I, I've well, got a few favorites. Ben, what do you do? What do you use? Well, it's it's a non-native, but there's a Miscanthus sinensis. Um, that's the it's one. Got a, yeah. That's the one you would. Yeah. yeah. How do you spell it's, that? I'm writing it down. Yeah. Miscanthus sinensis uh, yeah, or Chinese feather reed. Is that the common? There, yeah, there's one there, but the 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 Miscanthus morning light Miscanthus is probably one of the nicest, tall but skinny and tight um looks and then there's another variety if i could get it straight here uh Adi, Geo, i think it is if i'm saying it correctly which it's kind of like bluey green during the season turns orange in the fall but Ooh, they're tight beautiful. they're tall uh miscanthus grass yeah uh, i agree with ben uh, and, and and they are they're so versatile they're drought tolerant year round yeah yeah I noticed something you're driving on the highways in Ontario, um, particularly going out to the county or, or going up towards Caledon. You see those beautiful, tall, I, could, I just call it ditch grass, and it's just tall, long, beautiful grass and has the, the plume on top. What, what, that what might be them? Phragmites. Well, right. well, the Phragmites is, has, is an invasive species that unfortunately uh, has crushed a lot of the bulrush out of yeah. existence. 
Isn't Let's it see. also like a razor grass? Like that stuff can cut you and people think, oh, it looks beautiful. <laughs> they, go, they go to pull We don't that. want that. That's I actually, awesome. I, was, yeah. I was naive to know what that stuff was. My uh, let's see, this is going back, oh, geez, almost 25 years ago. And my girlfriend uh, at the time was saying, oh, I would like some of that to make arrangements. And I went to go pull it. It was literally oh. cutting my hand. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I heard wow. guitar string. Yeah. yeah. So the, you know, the thatched roofs, this is an architectural, you know, the thatched roofs in, in like an English cottage? Yeah. yeah. It's made out of Phragmites. It's dried mm -hmm. European reed grass. Uh, it's a really tough material. Yeah. So, so if I was to go, let's say, and and uh, use a shovel and dig up some of that grass and want to bring it back to my place in the city to put it in a box, charged. bad idea. <laughs> bad idea. <laughs> We're not coming on the bad. show again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I hear what you're saying. So no ditch grass. Okay, no. I got it. Okay. What about okay. the flowers? Anything no, else? No? <laughs> Especially not the flowers. <laughs> You're so funny, Emmanuel. Uh, <laughs> they're so okay, pretty. How are we though. doing? Any more questions, Joelle? I think we're pretty good for the day. Uh, if there's any other questions that I didn't get to, I'll definitely gather them all up and send them out if uh, we can send out so many additional questions to people. Sure. Well, Dave and Ben, I had a lot of fun with you guys today. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. And Ben, it was, it was great, great meeting you as well. I had the privilege of uh, spending time with your dad on a few occasions on conversations re revolving around the horticulture and the industry. We actually oh. interviewed him ourselves in, in one of our uh, publications and, and wonderful guy. And I'm glad that you're, you're following those footsteps as well. And, uh, and also and, in the, your own. And, yeah. and in the food business, that's, that's awesome. Uh, uh, that's, that's great. So, well, thanks Dave. I, uh, I've actually, I'm calling dad right after this. I'll pass it along. I'll tell him okay. we met. All right. Sounds it's good. A small world. We all get to meet. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I love this. I love this. I think this, I think this is, uh, definitely one of the benefits of this, uh, the COVID situation. It's mm -hmm. really pulled a lot of ideas and people and uh, increase this connectivity between people that perhaps we didn't have before just by the barrier of of space and you know location so now we that's all crumbled and we're all together so yeah. thank you for yes. spending your time with us today we really super appreciate it yeah thanks for having yes. me with you guys i've really appreciated the opportunity to share with everyone so thanks for that and uh, anytime you want to grill in the backyard and you want to invite us into your circle, uh, I'm up for it. Yes, you win, you win. Yes, good, man. It's all good. I'm good. Sure enough. I'll, I'll bring food. Okay, all right. Okay. I'll great. grill it up. Okay, guys. All right, everybody. Thank you so very much. And for everyone right. joining and stuck around a bit longer with us, thank you so much uh, for doing this. And see you guys real soon. Take care. Okay, Bye -bye. take care. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye -bye. I'll be shortly muting everybody and closing the screen. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful afternoon.